today we will be going through the process of visualization of alternative splicing events in IGBE and how to go about designing primers to test these observations. Now this is a really important and powerful tool as new techniques such as RNA-seq, which can generate millions of short reads in a cost-effective way, allows us to discover differences in alternative splicing due to things like developmental stages, environmental stresses, etc. Since we haven't held a focus on feature in a while, I'll be giving a brief refresher on using IGBE, and we will then transition into loading and viewing alternative splicing, and finally, how to go about designing primers to validate alternative splicing events. If at any point during the tutorial you have any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me and ask away. In addition, if I move too fast or if you miss something, please ask me to repeat the previous steps. If you have downloaded Igby and would like to follow along, please do so. If you're watching the tutorial and would like to try Igby later, the recording of this tutorial will be online this afternoon for reference. In addition, I will be available for the rest of the day for questions. So first off, how to load and start Igby. So to download Igby, go to bioviz.org and follow the links labeled download and you'll see that there are three options. Usually the media memory option is the best option um, if you're using a computer with between four and eight gigabytes of RAM. Also keep in mind that you'll need to have Java installed. Once installed, an IGBE icon should appear on the desktop and IGBE should open. If not, double click the icon to open IGBE. When IGBE opens, you'll be presented with a carousel showing many of the currently available genomes. Um, this is the IGBE home screen, which can be accessed at any time by clicking on the blue species link in the upper right hand corner. As you can see, IGBE offers access to all current genomes and the various versions of each of these genomes. In order to select these genomes, you can either select uh, through the carousel or through the species drop-down menu. So you want to look at Bos Taurus and then the genome version. For today's example, we will be using Arabidopsis. So I will go ahead and click and load the latest genome version. So IGBE has two major functions. First off, it allows you to access your data visually so you can answer questions or look for patterns that are not evident by examining the data alone. Second, IGBE is good at producing high resolution visuals that communicate the data well, including being able to produce publication quality figures. Okay, so how do we want to navigate in IGBE? So here we can see that we have our Ter10 uh, genome loaded with our negative and positive strand. We can see that many of the mRNA models are visible. So to start off with, let's practice zooming through this genome. So if we click on a region that we're interested in, we can zoom into this region in a number of different ways. You can either use the zoom slider here to zoom in and this is going to zoom in on this zoom stripe that I've positioned here. Let's say we're interested right here. Similarly, we can just use the plus or minus buttons to zoom in on this region. In addition, if there's a region you're interested in, you can simply drag along the coordinates axis to highlight this region and zoom in to that region. Or, if a particular gene model is interesting, you can simply double click on it to zoom in on that gene model. For moving horizontally, we can use this slider at the bottom of this viewer. And this will move us along at a relatively quick pace. In addition, you can also switch to the grab tool and simply drag yourself along or my favorite, which is just to hold the Option or Alt key, which will automatically switch you to the Grab function. So I have to zoom back out. As you'll notice, we have very smooth zooming in Igby. This is something we're very proud of and works very, very well. Okay. 
So now that we've had this a brief refresher on navigating through Igby, I want to provide us with an example of alternative splicing and then we will investigate it. So in our example, let's pretend we just finished a large RNA-seq experiment where we were interested in the differences in alternative splicing between a control group and an experimental group that was cold treated. Let's load up this data and take a look. In the data access tab, go to the available data. So you'll see here that we have IGBY quick load. Go to the RNA-seq, Learning Lab, right. Mixed Cold, SM for single maps, Reads. And what we're going to load is the control and cold alignments. As you can see here at the top, we've loaded both of these tracks in, but they both appear grayed out. This is correct as these files are quite large and could overload your system by trying to load all of the data at once. So the quick load site that we loaded this from uh, has many files and anyone can create their own quick load site. In addition, if you have files on your local computer, you can go ahead and just open them through uh, the open function here, or even simpler, you can just drag and drop those files straight into Igby. Okay. So our analysis has indicated that we have a gene of interest um, that is very important to our model organism. So let's do a search for the LHY gene. So up here in the uh, search, Bar. I'm just going to type in LHY. This is going to identify right here. So LHY1 or LHY. Click on it. And it should take us to the LHY gene model. As you can see here, there appears to be five different gene models for LHY. And they all appear on the minus strand. So before we look at our alternative splicing data, let's simplify this view a little bit to give us some more space to work with, considering we're kind of jammed up right here. So if we click on either the minus or positive strand, go down to the bottom and click on annotation, we can then combine these two tracks into one using this strand plus minus. Now we can see that all five of these uh, gene models on the negative strand are now combined with the plus and minus strand. We can simplify this a little bit further by changing the stack height. The stack height will change the number of reads or gene models that are currently visible. So in this case, we have five. If we optimize it, it jumps to five. Similarly, we could change this to any value we wanted. We're now going to lock the track height. So this is just the physical height that this occupies on the screen. And let's lock that at 200 pixels just to give us a little bit more space to work with. Okay, much better. So let's go ahead and load in our data for our cold and control alignments. So as I said before, this track is currently blank. In order to load in the data, you click load data. And then let's go ahead and load in the sequence. This will load in the sequence from the genome within view. Okay, so now we can see we have a lot of reads and that we probably have even more reads here. So let's go ahead and just see what this looks like. So I'm going to shift click, select both of these tracks and I'm going to click optimize like I did before for the tear 10 mRNA. And let's just see what we come up with. There are a lot of reads. So how could we go about trying to identify alternative splicing events? One of the ways is we could try and zoom in on these. So let's expand this using this uh, zoom slider on the left side. And this will give us a zoomed in view showing all the different reads within this region. So here we can see we have some interesting reads here some more here. And doesn't appear to be any there. So there's nothing here. 
quite interesting. Of course, this is a lot of data, and it's a little hard to visualize, though it does a very good job of zooming in, so we can expand these regions more or less. But IGBY offers several other functions, which should make this even easier to look at and analyze. So what we really want is a way to visualize and quantify the number of reads which occur at junctions, allowing us to better visualize what alternative splicing is occurring. To do this, we can use the junction track feature. So let's select both of these tracks. Let's go down to the annotations tab again. Under the operations, we're going to go to the single track dropdown, and we're going to select find junctions and then hit apply. Okay, and as you can tell, again, we have two somewhat squished little graphs up here. So we want to expand those. So the easiest way to do that is we're gonna click the minus sign for each of these. And so this is gonna simplify them down. And then I'm going to go ahead and put each track uh, next to its, its other track. So controls and our experimental are together. OK, so each junction has a numeric label indicating the number of gapped reads that support that junction. So we can go through this and quickly tell you know, how many reads are there that support each individual junction. So this is kind of an interesting example right here. Here we can see in our control, we have 132 reads which support uh, no exon within this region. Whereas in our experimental, we have 86 that support no exon within this region, but then we have nine and 16 which support this one. So let's zoom in here and take a closer look. Just what exactly do those numbers refer to? So, so 132 and 86, what? what what do those mean? So these are, let me tell you exactly what it is. Uh, so these are numeric labels that indicate the number of gapped reads um, which actually support that junction. So if yeah. there's a read on either side, and I believe the way this is designed is that there has to be five bases on either side in order for that, that to be written to. So it's it's the reads. So it's reads that had to be broken in order to align them. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, it's a good description. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Keep going. Okay, so one of the other features that is cool in Igby is that we can click on these different reads and see where their uh, edges match. So this is the edge matching feature. And so we can see here that this aligns with these and aligns with these models. Similarly over here, these edges match here and along these models. Okay, so now that we have kind of an interesting example, we wanna compare our control versus our experimental. And what we really want to do is be able to validate these results. Um, so we would probably be doing this through some form of PCR technique, um, maybe with new samples or by varying experimental conditions to see if we still see alternative splicing. So our new objective is to design primers to test for this exon exclusion event. So for this example, we are going to design primers within these flanking exons. The idea being that we can then uh, look to see just on a gel whether or not we have this, in, this exon included or not. So if the exon is included, the gel size should be larger than if it is excluded. So in order to do this, let's start off by clicking on our gene model here. And then I'm going to shift click and click on the opposing flanking exon. So we're surrounding our, our exon here. Then I'm going to right click and view genomic sequence. Uh, 
I'm sorry, see. how did you get that box to show up? So that was shift click on the flanking exon here. And then I'm going to shift click on this other flanking exon on the other side. And then right click and view genomic sequence in sequence viewer. Okay, now I'm just going to change the color really quick. And so what we can see here, Igby has highlighted in blue our two flanking exons with the intervening sequence here in black. And so in order to design primers around this, what we want to do is select this exon. I'm going to go to copy copy selected DNA sequence. Now I'm going to jump to a separate program. The program is called Primer3. It is well regarded in terms of designing primers. Um, and this is what we ourselves use. So Primer3 is freely available online. And I'm going to paste that first exon in here. And then I'm going to hit enter twice. And we'll see why I do that here in a second. So let's jump back to Igby. Let's highlight our second exon. And copy. And paste. OK. So the way Primer 3 works is that it's going to design primers around a region that we define. And in order to define that region, we use brackets. So if our exon is excluded, we still want to get a, a product size that is at least a couple hundred base pairs. So in this case, I'm going to put a left bracket somewhere in the middle of this first exon right here. And then similarly, I will put a right bracket in the right flanking exon. Put it right here, let's say. And now I'm going to get rid of this space. OK. Now, as you can see, Primer 3 has many, many, many options. We're not going to change any of the default options for today. But if you need to, there are things like primer size, primer melting temperature, GC percent. Um, so there are many, many options. OK, so in order to get our primers, I will click on Pick Primers. And as you can see, Primer 3 has very quickly found us um, two primers. And you can see these primers in this kind of text box here. So this will be our, this is the defined intervening sequence. Our two primers, the forward and reverse. And then our product size of 236 base pairs. So let's, as, as good as this is, what we really want to be able to see is kind of a, a visual um, analysis of where those primers are, how they fit into our analysis of alternative splicing, make sure they're facing in the right direction. Um, so what we want to do is I'm going to select this first primer, I'm going to copy, and let's jump back into Igby. Now, in order to search for primers or residues, we would use the Advanced Search tab. So in the Advanced Search, go down to this Search drop-down box, select Residues. I'm just going to get rid of that. Then we're going to paste in our first forward primer and search. As you can see, Igby has very quickly found it and located it within our left flanking exon. So let's jump back and grab our other primer. Here. Copy. And search. OK. So we can now see that both primers are displayed in Igby. The forward primer here is slightly raised, while this reverse primer is slightly lowered, so we can tell which direction they are facing. 
we have all kinds of information here. Um, the sequence, the color that it matches to, start end, which strand it's on, uh, and the sequence that it matched to. And that's the basic workflow for visualizing alternative splicing junctions and designing primers to validate them in IGBY. And so we know that our uh, product size, if this exon is excluded, was 236 from primer 3. And if it's included, you can just select it here and then go up to the I or information button here in the top right. And this is a prox or this is 82 base pairs in length. So if the exon is included, the total product length would be 82 plus 236. And I'll let you do that math. Okay, so before we finish, I would like to touch on some additional functionality that I think would be really helpful. Um, so I know what one product size would be. Uh, there, like, there's also a little bit extra on one exon mm -hmm. in that model. Is is there an easy way to to get a product size, like, to have Igby tell me how big the product would be for that whole transcript? Because just adding that one exon would be an approximation. Um, I mean, it's, it's okay if there's not, but you know, if I want to just make sure I didn't like forget about you know another exon or, or a slight difference in the exon sizes. Is there any way I can just get it to you know, find out you know, for sure without having to do math what the product will be for that transcript? Yes, so I won't go through all of how to do it, but basically what you could do is you could select um, this genomic sequence here for this version. And then if you wanted, you could actually go back into primer three load in your your new, let's say, um, two exons, and then you could actually tell Primer 3 what your primers already are, and then it will help you calculate exactly what that length will be. Is that okay? Yeah, and so would I just highlight, the t I'd have to highlight all three exons, wouldn't I? Yeah, if you, if you yeah, if the exon was included, yes. Or you could determine the length of these two and then add on the XN. So, okay. So some additional functionality very quickly. So it's important to remember that the residue primer search in Igby is not blast. It's going to search for the exact sequence that you put in. Um, the caveat to that is the use of wildcards. So for instance, let's say we wanted. So I'm going to clear this out. Let's say we wanted to search for a motif. And we know that that motif starts with, uh, let's say, ACT and ends with TG, let's say. But in the middle here, it could be anything. So in Igby, if you use a period, this represents any uh, nucleotide. So if we go ahead and search for this, we will see that the pattern here and that this can be anything and it's found these very quickly. Similarly, if you knew or if you had a motif where uh, let's say it was ACTT followed by either a C or a G, you can use brackets and then determine uh, exactly which nucleotides this will be. So this will be ACTT followed by either a C or a G. And so we can see here our pattern, ACTT, and then either a C or a G, and it's loaded these as well. What, what does the, the pink or, does the pink or green mean something? So the color in Igby currently is just determined by uh, in what order you search for them. So we, this was our first search was the ACT wildcard okay. TG. So, and actually going along with that, if we wanted to search for multiple residues or primers simultaneously, uh, this is also possible. And so in order to do this, what we use is the pipe symbol. So let me just grab a whole list of primers. I'm going to delete this. So here you can see I've put in multiple residues or primers, and I've just separated each one with this pipe symbol. And so when we search for them, they should each pop up in the order we put them in with a separate color. And you can see how they're quickly aligned here. 
So this would be a great way if you already had a list of primers and you just wanted to double check where they were, what direction they were facing, and kind of how they looked. Oh, how, how, do I, how do I know which direction they're facing? So two different ways. You can either look here in the strand to see if they're on the positive or minus strand, or you can see this isn't the best example, but all of these are kind of touching this coordinate track right here. If they were on the minus strand, they would be slightly lower. Uh, I was wondering why some were like that in the last. In, in, the, in the smaller searches, there were some that were a different height. I was wondering what that was. Yeah, so if we look at ACT, TG again, we search. Yes, so this one is on the minus strand. This one's on the minus strand. And then these two should be on the positive. Okay, and then lastly, let's say that we wanted to be able to quickly get back to this region and look at it, maybe load some data. So this is really easy if we use the bookmark function. So over here on the right, so we have this tab here, current genome that we're currently in. I'm going to click on bookmarks, and then I'm going to create or add a new bookmark at this location. And so we can just call this, let's say, our LHY primers. And I'll leave it at position and data. Hit OK. So now if I bump my elbow and I come flying over to somewhere here, I can just go right up here, double click on this, hit OK. And we're right back where we were. So in conclusion, we were able to load our RNA-seq data into IGBY, check for alternative splicing for our genes of interest. We designed primers for this alternative splicing events using Primer3, and then we're able to visually check those using IGBY. So that concludes our focus on a feature for IGBY.